This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, so at this point we have a fairly good idea about where these ions come from. And, and, and we have a somewhat to a good idea about how these ions actually bond to the exchange sites. Okay, we have electrostatic charges, and we have the, the rules that control that. We have ligand bonds, and then we have sort of uh, the, the, the chelation, of, uh, sort of expanded ligand bond, and then we also have disillusionment. Okay? Now, I put this up here, this nota bene. I put this up here because I want you to realize that the environment that this is occurring in is extremely, extremely dynamic. And this goes to Andrew's question earlier. You know, do these things come into equilibrium? Well, they do, but it's a very temporary e equilibrium. Anytime some kind of stochastic event comes in, anytime you start seeing decomposition of organic matter, you're going to change the concentration of these ions that are in the solution. And the minute they start changing, they're going to start changing the composition of what's at the cation exchange sites. Okay, because they're going to start exchanging with it. Right? Okay. So let's actually talk about what that cation exchange site means. What is CEC? What is cation exchange capacity? How do we quantitatively measure this capacity of a soil to hold on to these cations or potentially anion exchange capacity? How do we in fact measure a soil's ability to hold on to anions? Cation exchange capacity is basically just a measurement of the total amount of exchangeable cations a volume of soil can hold on to. Okay? And we basically use milliequivalents because we we're interested in the charge. Okay? So it's moles of charge, okay? amount of charge. Okay? So example that I show here is one potassium ion with a plus one charge is equal to a half of a calcium charge because it has a plus two charge. Right? So one calcium would be equal to two potassium. Does that make sense? We're looking at the charges. This has two charges. This has one charge. So calcium is equivalent to, uh, a, a potassium is equivalent to one half of a calcium charge. It's also equivalent to one third of an aluminum charge because aluminum has plus three. We're literally talking about charges here, how many positive charges you can hold on to. So if I had a molecule that had, I had a colloid that had a plus three charge, it could hold on to one aluminum, it could hold on to three potassium, and it could hold on to one calcium and one potassium. It couldn't hold two aluminums because it doesn't have the charge capacity. This charge is largely dependent on whatever that molecule is, determined by the clay and the organic matter, or the content of that soil. Okay. Here's the, I put this chart up here so that you can actually see the, the differences in CECs based on the material. If I have an organic matter, I'm looking at 200 to 1,000 milliequivalents charge-wise per kilogram. So it can hold up to 200 from 200 to 1,000 charges in that kilogram. Okay? Smectites, 90 to 150. Illites and chlorites, now this is CEC, cation exchange capacity, 10 to 30. And then we get down the kaolinites and the oxides, basically nothing. Okay? So the nature of the material is going to affect that CEC because it has to do with the permanent charge and the pH dependent charge. But permanent charge is the big thing when we're looking in these guys. Now, give you a good example. Okay, the Mississippi going through here, okay, going down, right through in here, joining up, and then heading down to Louisiana. Okay, so basically you're looking in between the two rivers here. You know, take a look at this, and then take a look at this chart over here. Up here, small CECs or small milliequivalents. As you go darker and darker and darker, your milliequivalents increase. So. That means that my cation exchange capacity, as I get darker and darker and darker, increases. Does that make sense? OK, now let's look at this landscape. And I want you to look at two spots. I want you to look basically at this really dark spot here compared to this really light spot up here. 
what type of materials do you think I have in this location? If I have really high cation exchange capacity. You have a choice of two things, basically. I have lots of organic matter, or I have what? Clays. Clays and silts totally make sense if you think about this river system. This is the floodplain. When we go out onto the floodplain around here, what, when we were at Dillman this week, what kind of soils did we have? Silts and clays. Okay? When we were up at the higher elevations to the edges, we started getting into the sands. Okay, what is this? We talked about this earlier in the semester when we were talking about entosols. And these were SAM ends. These are sandy. The nature of the surfaces, I have very few surfaces volume wise. Okay? And I'm looking at sil silica oxide type of stuff. I'm not even looking at clays. So as a result, my cation exchange capacity in these sandy soils are greatly reduced compared to my silty clay soils. And that's just, if we don't even have to talk about the mineralogy there. Okay, we're just looking at the charges associated with the surface areas. Okay? Now, why is this important? If I'm a farmer, just because I am growing crops here doesn't mean I can't successfully grow crops. But I have to think about my fertility management really hard and think about when and how much I'm going to be adding nutrients in this type of situation versus this type of situation. Well, just because I have a high CEC doesn't necessarily mean I'm fertile. My soils are fertile. But it does mean that I have an ability to hold on to those nutrients much better here than I do here. Which means I have to be careful about how much fertility I add from a fertilizer sense to this location. Why? Those ions, those, ions, those nutrients are going to go to two places. One is your plant roots, and ultimately the other one is leaching. Cation exchange basically defers that process. If I don't have high cation exchange and my plants aren't sucking it up as quickly as I put it in, where is it going to go in this scenario? It's going to go down the Mississippi and end up here. Right? Here, on the other hand, because I have such a high CEC, these soils have a very good ability to hold on to those nutrients temporarily until ultimately they're either taken up by the plant or leached away. Does that make sense? OK. How do, in fact, do we measure this? OK, I have a soil here. This is out of your book. But I have a soil, and I basically put it into a, a, a funnel. Okay, and what I do is I pour a liquid on top of it. In this case, I have an excess ammonium solution. I saturate it. Now remember these rules for exchange. <coughs> the bigger ones will knock off smaller ones. High charges will knock off smaller charges. Big ones will knock off smaller ones. Okay, or constant, I should say concentration, the largest amount. So what happens? if I want to, in fact, figure out my cation exchange capacity. Well, I can take, a look, take advantage of those rules, and I can basically throw in a really big one, or I can throw in uh, a high-charged one, or I can just throw in a lot of something and knock everything out. Okay? So in this scenario, I'm throwing in a solution that has a high concentration of ammonium. Okay? I throw it in here. Okay? Ammonium is also rather large. It only has a plus one charge, but because I'm just using so much of it, I basically saturate the system and I'm knocking everything else off. Make sense? So in this scenario, basically what I'm doing is I'm driving the system so that all the exchange sites have ammonium on it. I'm knocking everything else that comes out into solution. Make sense? OK. Now, at this point, I still don't know what the CEC is. What I do next is I throw another solution in with a different ion. And that next ion basically is going to drive out all of the ammonium and replace it with potassium. But what I'm going to get is a pure solution of ammonium. And I can measure how much ammonium is in here. And it can give me an idea about what the CEC is of my initial soil. 
Now, why do I do that? Why don't I just measure this and measure everything except ammonium? I have a mix of different charges. And the reality is there could, in fact, be ammonium in here. The ammonium could be present in this soil. We got this from the real world. right? So I basically drive it out, saturate the system in this, then drive that out and measure the concentration. Okay? The other important thing here is just because I have the CEC, just because I have that amount, doesn't actually mean that all of those sites are actually occupied by cations. And this is where we get into a concept that's called base saturation. Okay? I have a total ability to store nutrients. But just because I have, imagine this. Okay, I have a, a volume of soil, okay, and it has the ability to hold on to 100 charges, positive charges, right? Does it mean that all of those charges are, in fact, going to be occupied by cations that are nutrients? Okay? I want to have a good measure about how much of that cation is of, of that cation exchange capacity is actually occupied by nutrients. Okay? So I think I missed a jump here, but okay. So base cations, you've heard me use this term before. Base cations are basically calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium or other non-acid cations versus acid cations. Bases, base cations, when I say base cations, I basically, I'm not talk, these are not technically bases. They are basically non-acid base cations that serve as bases because what they do is they act to neutralize the protons. Okay, so if we read this, technically these are non-acid base cations. But they do serve to reduce the acidity, so they serve as bases. You guys know what this has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.